So we're happy to discuss no, that. Yeah. So, yeah. So, uh, yes. Thank you very much. So, first of all, just after this session, there will be an exercise session. Well, we will have two wonderful TAs, Mireille Zorgel and Harry Petit. And uh, so the exercises are just right here and also on my web page, if you want. Okay, any question before I start my lecture? Okay, great. So today I will talk about uh, local to global results, uh, a classification of isometries. And I will talk about hyperbolic spaces and how they relate to injective metric spaces, okay? So one, when we want to say that spaces are non-positively curved, to my mind, there are two characteristic properties. The first one is that when you have geodesics in your space, they tend to diverge. So we saw this yesterday with the conical bicombing. And there's also nice path in heligraphs that diverge. And there's another property of non-positive curvature that it is local. Namely, the classical notion of curvature of a Riemannian manifold is really a local one. And usually you have a carton adama theorem, which tells you that if you have a simply connected Riemannian manifold, which has non-positive sectional curvature, then it's globally cat zero, and you have nice global results. And so we would like such results for injective spaces and heligraphs. Furthermore, it would be, it's much easier to check local things than global things. So let me start with uh, the local to global properties for graphs. So if X is a graph, uh, I remind you that I can consider the flag completion of X, which is simply the simplicial complex where you add a simplex for each click on your graph, okay? And then there's this very nice local to global characterization, which is due to Chopin, Chepoy, Genevois, Hirai, and Osanda. If you have X, a connected graph, you have the equivalence of the following two properties, uh, three properties, sorry. So we want simple connectedness and local heli, essentially. So the first one will be uh, that the flag completion is simply connected. So in fact, since we just need simple connectedness, you could just look at the triangle complex of X that's enough, which is the two skeleton of this simplicial complex. And the second condition is that X is what we could call one heli. What does it mean? That one balls satisfy the heli property. What does it mean? When you take any family of balls of radius one, which pairwise intersect, they have a global intersection. So the second equivalent condition, it's a slight variation. So you also require the global condition that it's simply connected. And you ask for something else that X is click heli. So what does it mean? So it does not mean that clicks satisfy the heli property. It's slightly more subtle is that maximal clicks satisfy the heli property. So what's a maximal click? So I remind you, a click is a complete subgraph. And a maximal click is a complete subgraph that is maximal with respect to inclusion. And finally, it's equivalent to X being heli. So this result is amazing, notably because it works for any graph. You don't have any local finite assumption, any graph which is connected. And also because checking click heli, it's very simple. It's very, if you look at clicks, they are complete graphs. So it's a very small local condition to check. And just from this result, we can have a, a pretty simple consequence that the thickening of a Casio cube complex is heli. So X is a Casio cube complex, say, uh, of locally finite dimensional or even yeah you, you can't read which one here this one 
the three lines here you can't read uh, you want me to write them above yeah okay so the first is So the flag condition is simply connected. And X is a click heli, meaning that maximal clicks uh, satisfy the heli property. So heli property. And this is also equivalent to X is heli, which is, I remind you, any, the family of all balls satisfy the heli property. So as a consequence, if I take X uh, locally, finite dimensional, or even without infinite cubes, cat zero cube complex, I can consider a different graph, which is called the thickening of X. I defined this in the first lecture, but I will define it again. Why the thickening of X? So it's the graph, the vertex set of Y is the same as the vertex set of X. And I add an edge in Y between X and Y if the are in a common cube of X. I'd add all possible diagonals to my graph. Then Y is a heligraph. You can see that it will be a rather easy consequence of this characterization. So how can we see that? So first, the flag completion of Y, it will be uh, it will be homotopy equivalent to the to the to X as a cell complex. It is contractible. So in particular, it is simply connected. And now we want to use uh, this characterization. This one is the simplest to to use. What are maximal clicks? Well, if you take pairwise a set of vertices in a cat zero cube complex which are pairwise in a common cube then it's not hard to to see using the median property that uh, median property implies that uh, maximal clicks in y, in x in y sorry are exactly the set of maximal cubes in X, okay. In a cube, every vertex is connected, so it's a click. If you take a maximal cube, it is a maximal click, but you don't have any other. And it's easy to see that cubes in the cat zero cube complex satisfy the Halley property. It's a consequence of the flag condition. Okay, so you see that maximal clicks are cubes, Cubes satisfy the heli property. So Y is click heli. And using the local to global result, we see that Y is a heli graph. Okay. So you see, we passed from a compli complicated graph to just checking a local condition, looking at the neighborhood of a vertex, essentially. Okay. And now I will pass to the local to global result for injective metric spaces. So this has result as two proofs. So the first one is due to Mish in the proper case. And Mish's proof follows Brightson proof for the Carton Adama theorem for cat zero spaces using Baikon means. And my proof uses the heligraph. So I've find it quite fun to use graphs to prove results about injective metric spaces. So X, uh, it's just any metric space here, metric space. Then we have the following equivalent properties. X is complete, simply connected, complete connected, simply connected, simply 
connected. And we want to say that it's somehow locally injected. So what do we say precisely here? I ask that it's uniformly locally injected. So what does it mean? It means that there exists some radius such that every ball of radius R is injected. And in fact, you can even ask more. You can that uh, to ask that it's locally, uniformly locally injective, meaning that you can allow this radius to depend on the point where you're looking at. It could, for instance, cover finite volume hyperbolic manifolds or stuff like that. And this is equivalent to X is injective. Okay. So how does the proof go? Well, as, as I alluded to, I will use the property for graphs, but we have an injective metric space. How can you pass from injective metric space to graph? That's simple, really. You add edges between points which are close. So I find some, some value epsilon, which is small enough, say smaller than R over two. I will define a graph gamma epsilon with the vertex set of gamma epsilon being the whole of X, it will be a huge graph and an edge between X and Y if there are a distance at most epsilon. Now, it's not hard to see that the flag completion of this graph is simply connected. Why is that? Well, you can contract everything to a um, to a small to a small ball, and inside a small ball, you're contractible. So it's uh, so it's not hard to see. And we also want to say that uh, uh, gamma epsilon is uh, say one heli, and in fact, every one ball in gamma epsilon is contained in a epsilon ball in X. So if you look at pairwise intersecting one balls in gamma epsilon, they all live in two, some say two epsilon ball, which is supposed to be injected. So gamma epsilon is one heli. Okay. So now I use the local to global result about graphs, which works for any graph, even this huge graph, then it tells us that gamma epsilon is heli. And now what you want to do is take the limit as epsilon goes to zero. Well, xd is equal to the limit as epsilon goes to zero of this graph with the rescaled metric. Well, this is roughly the ID, but one problem is that we don't know that limits of injective metric spaces are injective in general. We need some properness assumptions. So this is the philosophy, but it's not actually how the proof goes. In fact, for every epsilon positive, XD is epsilon coarsely injective. I will define this a bit later. We prove that it's injective up to some additive error, which is arbitrarily small. And using completeness, we can prove that it's actually injective. But this is the real philosophy, that it's a limit of a graph. Any question about these? So these are very powerful tools to, to build injective metric spaces and graphs, just looking at local conditions. So um, I will use them in the lecture tomorrow to, to produce a large variety of injective metric spaces and heli graphs. And I will now present to you um, a way to classify isometries of nice injective metric spaces and of graphs and graphs. So you know that any isometry of the metric space, well, it could either be nice, say it takes a point, or be a translation, or be bad, like a parabolic isometry or something like that. So we are happy when we have only semi-simple isometries of the metric space. 
And this happens if you add the conditions on your on your spaces. So now, we'll first talk about isometries of injective metric spaces and how we can, um, in which situation we can say that they are semi simple. So it's a result due to Beckham and Long. <laughs> Essentially, works in the framework of spaces with a convex geodesic bifolding. So, if X is a proper metric space, G acts on X properly and co compactly with its strong assumption, like we do, for instance, on the of the zero spaces. We have some instances of rising average, so when we have a proper and co compact action of the group, then then for any more any element in G, it will also be simple. Either either elliptic. So elliptic means that in the equivalent any any G orbit orbit By combining by axis. So we want to talk about the existence of an axis. So there will exist an axis. There will even exist an axis for any nice choice of uh, by There exists a geodesic sigma axis in X, which is translated by G. So either you fix a point or you translate a nice axis. That's as nice as it could get. So how can can one show this? Well, in fact, the first part works for any group of isometries with bounded orbits or any injective metric space. There's a general construction of a circumcenter, even any bounded set in an injective metric space, there's a canonical way to pick a, a point which corresponds to the in the cat zero setup as picking the center of a ball of minimal radius here there's a canonical construction so any group with a bounded orbit as a canonical fixed point and yes yes so i so i did not state it sorry i to be precise, I stated that every injective metric space admits a conical bicombing. And I stated that if you are proper and finite dimensional, you have a unique convex bicombing. But I said that if you're only proper, it's enough to have a convex bicombing. So it's this part that I just here. You have a proper metric space. So there exists an equivalent convex bicombing. But in most cases here, the space will be five dimensional and this will there will be a unique search. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, I, I should say convex consistent. Sorry. So there, there's a, yeah. what it, it implies conical. So sorry. Um, so there's a zoo of properties of bicombings. So I define conical. I almost define consistent. But conical plus consistent imply convex. Okay, so uh, so it's the best you could hope for: convex and consistent, which is the same as conical and consistent. Yes. Um, so I can't read that. So there exists a geodesic uh, okay. gamma. What's that say? Uh, there's a geodesic in X, which is translated by G. There exists an axis, axis. and in in fact, there's even a nice way to choose it. But that's what you should remember: there exists an axis. So for the proof of ellipticity, you could use uh, circumcenters. And here, the common long use barycenters. So there's also a nice notion of barycenters in injective metric spaces. And they're, they they find the geodesic axis by taking a, a bar, using barycenter to find a limit. And it's where they use properness of the space. And one nice consequence of this is, in particular, you don't have distortion in injective metric space. If you have a group which acts properly co-compactly in an injective metric space, 
then every element either has, has finite order or is undistorted. So you don't have bonds like Sorita subgroups uh, inside injective groups. So this is for injective metric spaces. And we also have a, a very nice dichotomy for heligraphs. So at the end of the, my lecture yesterday, I recall that if X is a heligraph, I defined X prime uh, a heligraph, which is which I want to call the first heli subdivision of X. So the vertices of X prime are wrong clicks. Okay. So what does it mean? Wrong clicks is it's a click which is an intersection of balls. It should be thought as really a subdivision. If you take a cube, then the set of wrong clicks of, well, um, it will essentially correspond to the first barycentric subdivision of a cube. So it should be thought really as a, as a, uh, as a barycentric subdivision. So why do we need to look at this? Well, even in the case of Cat-Zero cube complexes, any isometry of the Cat-Zero cube complex will maybe not fix a vertex, but up to passing to the first cubical uh, subdivision, it will fix a vertex. Well, we have a similar result for heligraphs. We need to pass to a subdivision to have a nicer result. So it should be a... Okay. So it's a result with Damian, Zaida. So let X denote a heligraph. So as in the case of injective spaces, we need um, some restriction to have only semi simple isometries. And here, natural restriction is to bound the combinatorial dimension with finite combinatorial dimension n. So, what is this? It's the topological dimension of the injective ho. It's, it's finite, for instance, if your graph is, has bounded degree. It's coincides with the length, maximal length of chains of one clicks. You have different way of seeing this. And now if you have this, any automorphism G or any automorphism G of X, we have the same dichotomy. Either G is elliptic. So here it will mean that G has bounded orbits or equivalently G stabilizes a click of X or equivalently that G fixes a vertex of X prime, the first biocentric subdivision first heli subdivision. Okay, it's the same statement as in cube complexes. Every bounded orbit element, it stabilizes, it stabilizes a cube, which corresponds to a vertex in the cubical subdivision. And the other possibility is that G is hyperbolic. So here, it, what does it mean? It means that as here, the orbit map is a QI embedding, or equivalently that um, uh, there exists. Um, uh, so we can find an axis up to passing to a power. So there exists an, an integer smaller than two to the N where N is the combinatorial dimension. And there exists a vertex in the, in the first Halley subdivision such that for all N uh, in Z, the distance between G times a n dot x x. I'm sorry, there exists also a translation line. It's equal to the absolute value of n times x. Okay, so up to passing to a power of G, G to the A of bounded 
uh, exponent. They will, I will find a geodesic uh, sequence of vertices which form a geodesic for G2VA. Okay. And here, so it's, it's not as good as in the case of Cateau cube complexes, uh, well, where you could actually have a, uh, an actual geodesic in the, in the first cubicle subdivision. But here I said first heli subdivision. So there's for each integer n, there is an nth heli subdivision. So if you go to the nth heli subdivision, you can actually find an axis for G. So it means that up to changing your heligraphs, automorphisms are extremely nice. And in particular, you can see that every automorphism has rational translation length with denominator uniformly bounded by the combinatorial dimension of the graph. So that's, that's interesting. Okay. Uh, are there any questions? There are flat torus theorem in either of these settings. So, they come along. You have a flat torus theorem for spaces with a convex bicombing. For heligraphs, uh, not a better one than using the injective hull and using that. Uh, well, not yet anyway, but it should be true. Any other question? Yeah. Is it possible to understand the first subdivision locally? Uh, yes, the first heli subdivision is you, you can think, take your heligraph, take the injective hull. It's a natural, simplicial structure on the injective hull. It's the first set of this simplicial structure. It's also in the injective hull, space of functions from X to R which only takes values in half integers. There are equivalent descriptions. Um, well, yes, it's, if it's a round click, it will be an, uh, in a heligraph, yes, it will be an intersection of one balls, yes, okay. So now I mentioned what uh, I alluded to the definition of coarsely injective metric spaces. And now I will give more details about this. So let us define this. And we will see how it is useful in the study of uh, hyperbolic groups. So uh, coarse injectivity. Okay, so um, we say that the metric space is delta coarsely injective. If uh, so, we will take the definition of hyperconvexity and we will we'll just add an error of delta for each ball. So for every family of points x. I and for any family of radii such that we uh, the balls are supposed to intersect, meaning that for all i j r i plus r j is at least the distance between x i and x j, then we have the intersection of all balls whose radii are increased by delta. It's non empty. Okay, so um, one very simple remark is that uh, there's a nice way to to detect if if a metric space is coarsely injective by looking at its injective hull. Uh, so if X is a metric space, we have the following equivalent properties. So that uh, X is delta coarsely injective, and asking that if you look at the injective hull, it's almost surjective, is delta coarsely onto. So, what does it mean that any 
point in the injective hole is at distance at most delta from the image of the embedding. Okay, so if you relax the definition of hyperconvexity by a delta, it's the same as asking that your injective hole stays at uniform bounded distance delta. Okay. And now we can give the most meaningful example of a coarsely injective metric space. So which metric space do you think is coarsely injective and not injective? A heligraph, it's already zero coarsely injective. Oh, well, well, it depends what you mean that, well, you're right. It's a heligraph as a graph will be one coarsely injective. You're right. But um, I was hoping for a more meaningful example. I chose the letter delta for a reason. <laughs> what? Yeah, thank you. Hyperbolic spaces. So it's a nice result due to Lang. So I will state it for geodesic hyperbolic metric spaces because it's simpler, but it, there's another version for non geodesic ones. X, a geodesic delta hyperbolic space then x is delta coarsely injective. And if it's a vertex set of a delta hyperbolic graph, it will be delta plus one half coarsely injective. Um, if it's not geodesic, you only know that the injective hole will be delta hyperbolic, but it may be at infinite distance from the original space. So uh, I will choose the appropriate definition of hyperbolicity for my purposes. So uh, recall that X is delta hyperbolic if for any four tuple of points, X, Y, Z, T, and X, I have the following inequality, X, Y plus Z, T is smaller than the maximum of X, Z plus Y, T, T plus yz plus delta. And I chose to write xy in place of distance between x and y to have a, a formula which is easier to read. Okay. It's the four point condition. And use, knowing that, I can now uh, give you a proof of Long's result. It will go in two steps. The first step is showing that the injective hull of a hyperbolic space is itself hyperbolic. This part does not use that X is geodesic. So first part, E of X is delta hyperbolic. So in order to apply this criterion, I will take four points in the injective hole. So I remind you, in, my de in Long's description of the injective hole, points in the injective hole are functions from X to R, okay? So I will consider four functions in the injective hole, okay? Yeah. And I will have, say, I will dispose them like that, okay? I have E and F here. And the distance between E and F is defined as the supremum of all X of the of the difference between E of, e of X and F of X because it's a submetric. So for in order to avoid the epsilons, I will assume that the supremum is a maximum, okay? So assume there exists some X such that the L infinity norm of E minus F is precisely, I want that it's E of X minus F of X. So what does it mean? It means that there exists a point X uh, here, Okay, and so that's here. F is on a geodesic between X and E. You should think of the injective hole as a way of, it's an envelope of your space X, of your. And now, since uh, E is a point in the injective hole, for any X, there exists a Y in my space X such that it sits on the geodesic. It's the most useful property of points in the injective hole. For any point in the injective hole 
And for any x, I can find a y so that it sits on the geodesic. OK, so there exists a y such that the distance between x and y is equal to f of, sorry, e of x plus e of y. So it's a small lie. It should be a supplement. So up to epsilon, it's true. But I, I assume for simplicity that it's exactly on a geodesic. And now from this, we can deduce that we have the LMPT norm between E and F, which is X I minus E of Y minus F of X. Okay, if I combine the two, and I do the same with D and H. So the L infinity norm between T and H is equal to Z T minus G of T minus H of Z. Okay, so my two other points, G and H, are here and I have Z here and T here. Okay. And now from the picture, you see that you will have the Delta property. So now if you look at the sum of the two, well, you will see X, Y plus Z, T. According to the Delta hyperbolicity of X, it's smaller than one of the two, let's say this one up to symmetry, okay? So it will be smaller than x z plus y t minus e of y minus f of x minus g of t minus h of z plus delta. But now I can group the terms in the way I want, these ones and the other ones. Okay, y t. E of y g of t to deduce that it's smaller than the norm between f minus h plus e minus g plus delta but really it's the picture which tells you that you can put this picture inside the larger picture in x so it tells you that it's uh, delta hyperbolic so it, it's the first part it's true for any Delta hyperbolic space that the injective hole is itself delta hyperbolic. So, by the way, it's a useful thing if you want to look a group acting on a hyperbolic space which may not be geodesic. Here's a nice way to turn it into an action on a geodesic hyperbolic space. It's canonical. And now the second part is that uh, uh, the embedding of x into e of x is delta coarsely. On two, and this is simple now. If I take any f in E of x, then for any point x in x, by the minimality property of x of f for any x, there exists a y in x such that f of x plus f of y is almost the distance between x and y. I guess you meet exactly to make the proof simpler. So here I have x, y, and f. But now, since my space x is geodesic, I can find a point z in x, which is exactly at the same distance, but inside x. So such that the distance between X and Z is exactly F of X. And the distance between Z and Y is exactly F of Y. But now these four points live inside E of X, which is delta hyperbolic. So since E of X is delta hyperbolic, it implies that the distance between F and Z is at most delta. Any questions so far? It gives us half of the proof uh, of Lang's result that hyperbolic groups are heli. It's sort of the easy part because you see the proof is, is not very hard. The hard part is to, to know the local property. So here, if we take a hyperbolic space, we know that the injective hole is at bounded distance, but it could be non-proper. 
for instance, the injective hull of the, or, or the heli hull of the curve graph. It, okay, it's at bounded distance from the curve graph, but it's even wilder than the curve graph itself. Uh, so you need to control the local geometry to have some local finiteness. And this is the most uh, interesting part of Planck's work, I think. So uh, controlling the local geometry. So, and it works in a fairly general setup, which is uh, rather amazing. So uh, a graph X has beta stable intervals where beta is some constant. If for any three points such that Y and Z are adjacent, the distance between the interval between X and Y and the interval between X and Z is at most delta. So I look at the set of all geodesics between X and Y and the set of, of all geodesics between X and Z. And I want these spaces to be not too far apart. Okay, so I have here my whole interval between X and Y, my whole interval between X and Z. And I want that they're not too far apart. Okay, the, the maximal distance here is almost delta and here as well. Okay. Yeah. What? Thank you. It's it's beta. It's it's the standard notation in Lang's work. Thank you. So beta is a, is a number, at least one. And so what does it mean for any geodesic between X and Y? There exists a geodesic between X and Z, which is at distance uh, at most beta. So in fact, if you want to call a graph non-positively curved, it should have this property. It's, it's somehow like the grandmother of non-positive curvature for graphs in my viewpoint. Um, so what are examples of such graphs? Well, uh, heligraphs have one stable intervals. And for instance, median graphs have also one stable intervals. Question? The distance between the interval is the the heavy, the house yes, Hausdorff. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And hyperbolic graphs have stable intervals. It's quite obvious for, from the definition. And I don't know, you can add, add a systolic and, and I, I guess systolic and quadric graphs. I did not check, but I'm fairly confident. Um, correct me if I'm wrong. Okay. So it's supposed to be a very simple to check in, in all combinatorial cases. So now, uh, what is it useful for? Well, so the result by Lang states the following. So let X uh, either to locally finite connected graph with stable intervals. Then the heli hull of X is locally finite. So the subtlety in this statement is that the heli hull of X is locally finite, but as you go further and further away from X in the heli hull, the local finiteness could increase. So it's not uniformly locally finite. And this is for the heli hull, and equivalently it says that the injective hull is a locally finite, well, uh, say simplicial complex. 
for instance, for the simplicial structure that I described. So it's, it's really extremely nice locally. It's locally finite simplicial complex where uh, simplices are L infinity ortho simplices. So what, what's behind the proof? Uh, so the, the main idea is that beta stable intervals helps you control the cone types. So in a graph, the cone type, it's from a vertex and given another vertex, it's the shadow of this vertex, the way of, of continuing, a geo, continuing a geodesic below that, vert, behind this vertex. And if you have beta stable intervals, the set of all such cone types is finite in a very nice way. And long relates the number of possible cone types around the point to the dimension of cells in the injective hole. And the finiteness of cone types is also used in the proof of biotomaticity of heli groups. So it's not surprising that it's also, um, it's, it's a very strong property here that is being used. Yeah. Is it true that heli groups have rational growth for their? Uh, uh, I do not know. I do not know. Uh, so, at least for individual elements, as I mentioned, the translation length is rational with the uniformly bounded denominators. It's known for heli groups, for in heli hyperbolic groups, and I showed it for heli groups. But it it's a re very reasonable question. Um, well, if it's the only thing that's used, then yes, heli graphs are finite meaning cone types, lo locally finite. Yeah. Any other question? And now that we have everything, we need to uh, to conclude with the following result of Lang, stating that if uh, G is a Gromov hyperbolic group, and uh, X is uh, any heli graph of G, then uh, G acts properly and co-compactly on the heli hull of X. So in particular, G is heli. So how can we see that? So since X is hyperbolic. We know that the heli hull of X, which is contained in the injective hull of X, is at bounded distance from X. This is the coarse injectivity property. And since X is locally finite, hyperbolic, it has stable intervals. And using this, uh, using Lang's work, we deduce that uh, the heli hull of X is locally finite. So it's locally finite, but the action of G on the heli hull is co-bounded. So the action of G on H of X is co-compact. And so uh, one of the nice way to, to interpret this is that if you'd, in, in fact, Lang's work was mo mostly in the setting of injective holes. This way of remarking that it's actually a co-compact action on the heligraph, it's uh, due to Charlepin, Chepoy, Genevois, Hirai, and Osaida. But Lang's motivation was to, to show that maybe hyperbolic groups are not cat zero, but they still act properly properly co-compactly on a finite, locally finite simplicial complex with a piecewise L infinity metric, which has a unique convex consistent geodesic by coming. So it's almost as good as being cat zero. And uh, you could wonder, well, you have this, uh, this poset corresponding to the heli subdivision, the poset of round clicks. And on it, you could put the L infinity metric. It is injective. What if you put the L2 metric? 
So it's a subtle question. It may not be well defined because the length of edges is not well defined unless p is equal to infinity. So that's one question. But it could very well be that this same space with the L2 metric is cat zero. At least it's a candidate, a natural candidate uh, for this to happen. So can it really also cat zero with the MSA? No, it cannot. So it, 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 unless it's a tree, but whenever you have a two cell, it's uh, it, the the R2 with the L infinity metric, it's not cat zero. For instance, it's not uniquely geodesic, uh, but uh, no. Um, and you could also wonder about all the values of P. If you have P large enough, close to infinity, could it be uniquely geodesic, for instance? That's a, an interesting question, I believe. And we don't know. But uh, tomorrow I will talk about how, when you take a post set, when can you tell that it's uh, L infinity auto scheme realization is injective outside of the setting of heligraph, just looking at a poset. When can you tell that it's injective? Okay, thank you. Yeah? Um, my first, first, uh, exactly. Yes? Uh, there are the uh, oh, yeah. Equivalent definitions? I do not know. Um, um, I don't know. Uh, it's it's really not clear to me that there is a very nice functional property. Um, but yeah, I don't know. Yes. 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 How wide can the hyperbolic space be done on the A lot. Uh, so you may lose everything. Uh, the only thing that you retain is that your action is isometrically embedded in the new action. It, it's yeah, it's an artificial procedure to make your space geodesic. It's, yeah. How controlled is the local finite here? Like so it depends on beta, and if you are at distance, say r from the your space x, it depends on the cardinality of the ball in x of radius r. So it grows, say exponentially or something like that. So it's pretty bad. So it's a very good question. So if you have a locally finite graph, it could go bad in two ways. Either the dimension could explode or the dimension could stay bounded, but the local finiteness could explode. And it would be interesting to have a way to control either of those. Controlling the, the dimension of the injective hole is extremely interesting, but hard a priori. So if I take the envelope of just like a Cayley graph of a hyperbolic group, yes. it'll be locally finite, but maybe not uniformly so. Could... If you take a hyperbolic group, you mean? Yeah. Yeah, it, it, since the action is co-compact, it will be uniform. Yeah. Thank you.